today I am uh, going to take you back into the Pyramid of Unas. I have to make a correction. That's an important correction, actually, uh, from the last video where I made a mistake laying out uh, the, uh, the offering ritual onto the walls. I made a mistake uh, in terms of the last bit. So I am going to show this to you again with this correction. Then uh, in the next segment, I'm going to uh, discuss the last four columns of the south wall. There's something interesting that I want to show you there, a little bit of text analysis, and there's a little bit of an architectural uh, feature that, um, that may be important. And then what I'm going to do is to show you how the Pyramid of Unas architecturally has a connection to the Great Pyramid at Giza. And that's an interesting connection that has to do with numbers uh, inside of Unas Pyramid. It has to do with the uh, dimensions of the original Pyramid of Unas. So there's a few interesting features that, that um, reveal that whoever designed the Pyramid of Unas, both the, 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 uh, the architecture of the pyramid itself and then the, the, the text design, the layout of the text, whoever did this, must have had some knowledge of the architecture, the interior architecture of the Great Pyramid and the exterior architecture. So these are some interesting uh, details that I am uh, going to show you in the third segment. Okay, so let's get going. Let's go back into the virtual Pyramid of Unas. This is courtesy of Egypt's Egypt Exploration Society. And so we're going to go from the entry. All right, so uh, walking into the antechamber and then we're going to go to the west and go into the sarcophagus chamber because this is where the pyramid texts begin. <clears throat> so in the sarcophagus chamber, with this being west in front of us, uh, this wall is north, this is south. So the main, uh, the main two themes inside the sarcophagus chamber are two rituals. One is called the mouth, uh, I'm sorry, one is called the offering ritual and the other one is called the resurrection ritual. And the pyramid texts in their logical sequence really begin with the offering ritual. And the re offering ritual begins with the gable, the west gable, uh, with a series of spells that protect the, the deceased remnants that are entering this resurrection chamber, the duat basically, the netherworld, where Osiris dwells, the power to resurrect, in order to be able to enter this this dangerous world, um, the, the deceased is equipped immediately with some spells that he or she needs to make it through this, uh, this netherworld. And so the texts run from the north to the south. There's uh, 40 text columns here in the gable. And then they continue in three registered re registers on the north wall. So the text then Take, take over here in the upper register, you read them from west to east or from left to right. Then you go to the second register and you continue on and then the third register. This uh, is the main body of the offering ritual. And it contains, for example, the, um, the mouth opening ritual, which is basically the mummy getting its mouth opened with the atse with that uh, special knife so that it can receive the ka sustaining uh, food and drink that is then offered in all of these columns here. And if you notice in this part of the pyramid text, the, the king is referred to as the Osiris king, so Osiris Unis. And then uh, after this, uh, so after the text completes here in the, in the lower corner, then it continues in, the last few columns on this east wall. 
So these are this is uh, called invocation of the um, of the offering ritual and invocation of insignia. So that goes down to the bottom here, and then we continue into the the connecting corridor. And so this is still the offering ritual, and um, it continues in this direction. So from west to east again, and then the last column of the text, and this is very important, is the first column of the, and I just went too far, so let me go back over here. Yeah, so the last column of the offering ritual is this column right here, and the last symbol is down here. And let me just zoom in so you can see this. Uh, so what it says, is sedge uh, de sherui, which means to smash the, the the redware, the two red vessels, and that is a possible Heka spell. There's a Heka connection there. We don't have to get into it now, but uh, there's something that is uh, significant about the fact that there is just one column here. That why was that text dragged over to this wall, and then it had to be completed in this one column. Uh, and that has to do with the Sphinx. Um, I might get into it a little bit later, but I'm just mentioning it now. There is a potential reason why the offering ritual ends the way it does in this last, with this last column, which is also the first column of this wall. So that completes the offering ritual. And I mean, make this frame a little bit bigger. And so then what happens is we, we move over to the uh, to the resurrection ritual, and the resurrection ritual begins over here with Pyramid Text two thirteen, and it's read from the nor uh, from the west to the east, and it's all in long columns. So it's not in registered, even though it looks like there may be three registers, but that's not the case. In here, you read the columns all the way down. Uh, most of this has to do with commendations where the king's spirit is basically introduced. The king's ba is introduced to various uh, important entities in the afterlife. Uh, then the text continues and it goes all the way over here. And then this, remember, is still part of the offering ritual so the writ the resurrection ritual actually it it ends over here and then its final few columns are what we what we were left with here so here is where the resurrection ritual continues this is the commendation to newt the sky and then uh, there is the uh, commendations to the gods and in fact the last symbol of the resurrection ritual is the God sign over here. Uh, so that is the resurrection ritual. Now we've left something out and that is on the gable of the gable here of the, uh, of the sarcophagus chamber or the duat chamber. This here is called the response to the offering ritual. And that is read after completing the offering ritual. So it is before the resurrection ritual that you read this gable. So it would be after this column here that I mentioned, that is where the offering ritual ends. And then the response, which is basically the, the ka of the, of the deceased accepting the offerings. And that's written over here. And then you start over here with, as I mentioned with the resurrection ritual. All right. And then uh, you move over to the achet chamber the antechamber, architecturally speaking. And here is where we first, we first go to the gable, and these are spells to be able to leave the duat. Um, here then is the next part, which is the, the west wall of the antechamber or the achet chamber, and it's divided into two themat thematic segments. One has to do with the ka, this has to do with the ba, and then the two combine to form the Ach, which is the equipped spirit that's now ready basically to traverse the, the Achet. And let me just orient this. This is still a little bit too close. Let's 
let's go, go, go over here. Okay, so um, so the uh, the the texts end over here on the wall, and then they they pick it up. They pick up over here in the south wall, and this is the one. This is the wall that I discussed in my last video. So this entire text then. Um, it has to basically do with uh, with the synopsis and the details of how this journey uh, in the sky is going to occur. Basically, through the up the duat on the side of the Milky Way up to the ecliptic and then eastward, where Hoachti and the Sun are. Then, uh, so then the next uh, the next segment is the gable up here. This is the the east gable of the antechamber, and this is also read from south to north now. And this is basically encompasses the cannibal hymn, where the spirit is eating the magic, so to speak, learning the magic. Then we move over to the east wall, and his this is where the the combat zone is, so to speak. The magic is applied to fight the demons and snakes and uh, centipedes and whatever else is crawling around in the netherworld. This is fought over here using the magic that was basically acquired up here. And then here we have the special segment that I talked about, which has to do with the cave, which is where the spirit enters the primordial cave of creation in order to uh, basically reenact creation and in that sense, be able to um, resurrect and come back to the sky. Uh, and so going back to the sky is the ultimate goal of this whole entire pyramid text journey. And the way I'm interpreting it, and I have to keep reminding all of you that this is my interpretation, is that this here is uh, the Ka's journey, and the Ka ends up going with the sun along the ecliptic, and then the Ba's journey goes to the north. And that's why we have this text over here on the northern wall. And this has a special reading experience because even though the symbols are facing this way, you would think that you should be reading it from here to there, but that's not the case. You're actually reading it this way. So it is as if you're walking backwards. And this is the only wall where that's the case. And I have uh, the explanation that I'm offering for this is that it has to do with the phase of the moon and how the moon is moving on the ecliptic, but this isn't the topic for today. So I'm just briefly mentioning it. And so the text anyways, this has to do then with the Ba and the Ba is headed to the north, to the uh, to the imperishable stars around the North Pole. Um, and so it goes all the way to this corner over here and then they com the text complete first here on this wall, the west wall of the entry chamber, and then finally the east wall. and the last column of the pyramid texts in the pyramid of Unas is this last column. And the last word, in fact, is this here, which is, is pet the sky. Okay, so this is a, a recap this time. I hope I didn't make a mistake, but uh, it's, as you can see, the offering ritual is a little bit complicated in this layout and I think there's a reason for that because it, again, it has to do with simulating something at Giza. And I think um, that that is where the Sphinx simulation begins. Um, I didn't want to get into that today, so but I'm just basically mentioning it in passing. So what we're going to do uh, now is to look at these last four columns uh, of the South Wall. And so in order to do that, I... I am uh, loading this photo again. This is the overview. So I want to show you pyramid text 271, 272. And the probably the most important feature of this is this word root here. That means portal. It's a special type of portal. Aru is actually the front of a lion, so to speak, a lion gate. And this root is uh, a portal that's also mentioned over here. And if you Look at the determinative, it's the corner sign that's that's explaining what, what is meant by our root. And then if you look up in the corner, that's where you see the actual portal mentioned. It's the our root uh, net nu of, of, of nu, basically, the, this, the, the cosmic sea. And the location of this is in 
in the south. This is the south wall. This is the eastern aspect. So this is the southeast at the top of this wall. And this is going to become important in a moment when I take you to the Great Pyramid. There's an interesting architectural feature that uh, may play a role. It's uh, something that I just wanted to point out at least. So anyways, what I'm going to talk about now is these last two pyramid texts, 271 and 272, because there's some interesting textual features here. Uh, it also little, it gives us a feel also a little bit for the pyramid text style. So um, I am going to move this over then to just that segment. So I cut this out and now we're going to magnify this a little bit. So these photos are from Alexander Pierenkov's publication on the pyramid text they were taken by Natasha Rambova and uh, beautiful images. These are probably the best images of the pyramid text that are on the market still, even though they're black and white, but they're very, very sharp. Um, unfortunately, they're in segments, so they're not, um, they, so I had to splice them together and they're not exactly horizontally, vertically aligned. So, so that's why it looks like, a, it looks a little bit crooked, but it'll do the job for now. Um, so we're going to start here with 272, and um, I'm going to mark this as I'm going along. So Jet Medu means spoke, words to be spoken. Uh, unas Pai means Unas is the one. And then here is this interesting phonetic invocation potentially of Mehit. It says Mehet, Meheti Ta, which is just the, the land swimmer. It's just kind of a strange term and which is why when you see something like that you always wonder if there may be if that was a word choice because there is actually a heka invocation at play and of course there is another image of mihit which i showed you in another video so this i wanted to just emphasize this one more time and there is a confirmation which i call this double and triple stitching so when you have a suspicion that there may be a heka uh a Hecker invocation or insinuation at play, then you usually look for a confirmation. And there is one. It's a really nice one, actually. It comes just below. So let me continue. It says, uh, so uh, Unas is the, is the land swimmer. Meheti ta per em she. So it means he who has emerged uh, from the lake. And then it says, and what lake, of course, we don't know. But since since we know from we in the before this this, this pyramid text uh, a couple of columns earlier we were told that the ka of unas is being washed in the jackal lake and in the lake in the duat lake so this is a there's a good chance that this is in the it's still in the netherworld and this is a lake that's in the netherworld so it's a subterranean body of water basically and then it says unas unas pai zeshesh what uh wajet. So it means a fresh water lily. Uh, and the water lily is the is it's erroneously called the lotus, the blue lotus, but it's actually a lily. Uh, this is the one, for example, that has these uh, alkaloids that cause that can have psychedelic effects on people. And uh, in fact, on the in the cannibal hymn, there is a there is a segment where there is a Heka invocation probably of a brew made from wine, from the lily and from grain. So it, it's, it reads like it's a laced wine basically that has, and then you can, and if you keep on reading, you actually read about the effects it may have had on, on the author who was writing this. So it was probably under the influence of something when he wrote it. And this is a, a nice topic that I'm going to pick up in another video. It's a, uh, not for today, but I'm just mentioning it in passing. So, but anyway, so we have this mention of the lily, zeshesh, and of course, zeshu or zesh is, is the word for writing. And I mentioned this last time, but so we have this interesting connection between Mehit, of course, and the Writers Guild from the early uh, first dynasty and even all the way to the fourth dynasty when that title. Uh, was still used, the Mehit title in combination with writing, writing and archiving. So we have phonetically invocated Mehit and we have writing. Um, and I think there is a good reason for this because I think Logos, the, 
the, the act of creation through utterance and, and intellectual conception, which of course is also the basis for Abrahamic religion. So I think the ancient Egyptians, to them writing was basically like creating. And so if you could read and write, you were empowered to, uh, to create. Um, and it's just like in modern times, you know, when you write, you create something, you, people read the words and they have imaginations about it. So it is a form of creation. It's a kind of a simulation actually of reality inside of our minds when we think about the things that we read about. And this sort of captured is, captures it in a very nice way that Unas is, wants to uh, be, he wants to be in the place of creation to recreate. And in order to be able to do that, he has to be literate. And that literacy is sort of hinted here with the lioness Mahid and the, the lily, which is, goes, which phonetically invocates the rider. Um, and there may also be mind alteration or mind, mind expansion at play here because the lily, like I said, is later uh, potentially used um, to brew something that may have had a mind altering effect. So anyway, so there's, as you can see, there's a lot in, there's a lot potentially hiding in these words. And that's why I wanted to go through this really slowly, uh, just so you can see how beautiful the language is and how much information is resonating when you read this. Um, so then we go on, it says, Unas Pai Hetep Taui. So he, Unas is the one who has pacified um, or has brought peace to the two lands. Taui is the two lands. Then it says, Unas is the one, uh, Zemai Taui. So Zemai or I should say, uh, Unas Pai, yeah, Zem, Zemai, Zemai Taui. So he's the unifier. Um, he's the unifier of the, of the two lands. And this Zem has, is going to be used now in a, in a column down. So I'm going to alert you now that this is a nice word sound, a, a sort of a poetic way to use one word, but then there's going to be another word that's similar to that. Uh, and so it's very artistic. So this Zemai unifying, uh, I'm going to, to highlight this because it's going to come, something like this will come up in a moment. And then you, you might be able to make a, an association why unifying and this other word that I'm going to show you how those two might be relating. So anyway, so we have now, read, we're at the bottom of this column. So, um, so Unas, is the one is is the uh, the unifier of the two lands, and then it continues with Unas Pai. So Unas is the one. Demej Demeji. So he is the joiner now. Demej is a more physical unification. Um, it's you can think of it as joining, uh, coupling, for example. Joining is probably the best word. So Demeji, and then it says Mutef, which is his mother. Uh, and then here's this, what I was talking about. So now we have this word semat. And so zem, this is zemai with a, with a soft, with a soft Z. So zemai, and then here we have the word semat. So here, that's what this says is, Unas is the one who is unifying, the unifier of his mother. And semat in this case means the, the wild, female uh you could say cow the wild the wild cow uh so this is this means not domesticated this means wild so he is the he's the unifier uh, or the joiner of his mother who is the wild cow and it's she's the great wild cow red and the uh, the, the mother moot and net Unis, which is the mother of Unis, the other, this is uh, the other mother. So there's two mothers that are being mentioned here. Semat, again, the wild cow. And then it says Aidet, which is, um, which is the female cow. So this is basically another, another iteration that it's the, the, the feminine gender that is being referred to. So it's the Semat Aidet. 
So there's two cows basically, and he's joining them. They're both his mothers. And where are these cows? And they are Tepi Jew, which means on the mountain or on the hill, uh, Semi, which is grass, so on the grassy hill. And then here it says Tepi Jew, Zehehe, Zehehe, or Zehze. Either way, it's the stork. So I haven't been able to really figure out what the meaning is behind this, but the one thing that strikes me again is that we have the bird and the cattle. And of course, this is Ka and Ba. And this is the theme that there is uh, what I was mentioning in the last video, that the Ka and the Ba are accounted for specifically throughout this entire wall. Um, even though they are joined together and to form the Ach spirit, basically, but they're still separately accounted for in with their own insignia, with their own uh, with their own association. So, so here we have, even though we have two cows, but they are standing on two hills. Um, and so one of these hills is the grassy hill and the other one is the stork, the Zehe. Hiding, for example, in here, in this word, um, in this word, no, that's the wrong, this one is better. So Zehe, the stork, okay, is the word Nehe, which is eternity. Uh, so that could be, that could be the hill of eternity. It is possible that that's a Heka um, insinuation that's hiding inside of the stork. The other thing, the other association that uh, is worth getting out of here is the fact that Unas is now the child, right? So he has his two mothers. There's the stork. And I don't know if the stork had the same association with childbirth and babies in ancient Egypt. I don't know that. But I'm just mentioning it, and this is something that can be researched. But uh, we're getting now the idea that Unas is now um, basically going back, or he has resurrected, and now he is resurrected into a baby or a young child. And so now here, the mention of his two mothers. And this is a segment that I talked about last time, Aha, Jedu, uh, and then Hai, uh, the, the uh, head, head, jet, head, the head jet to, and those are the these these are basically uh, the spokes of a ladder. So this is the two ladder posts. Um, stand up the two ladder posts and bring down the footsteps of the ladder, basically, uh, so that unas uh, per unas emerge. So that unas emerges her. Uh, Harry Maket, which is the ladder. So it's basically a ladder into the sky. And um, we talked about the astronomy. I talked about the astronomy last time, so we don't have to do this again, but uh, it's a beautiful imagery, right? So we have the two jet pillars as the posts, and then we have the footsteps, and that makes the ladder. So explicitly mentioned. Um, and then I, it says, uh, it says, I read. I read an NF so to make for him for Unas uh, this ladder, and it says then Horus and Seth uh, M R. So they're basically giving an arm, Horus and Seth giving the arm for Unas, and uh, Shedesen means they take away, take him away. So to take Unas away, uh, Su means him with respect to the Duat. So this ladder we now understand is basically a, 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 um, a way to climb out of the netherworld, up into the sky. That's what this means. Shedet Sen Su Er Duat means basically to take, so that they, Horus and Set, take Unas away um, out of the Duat. Okay, and then we keep on going. Uh, here it says, um, it says I, ir or ir rather. So this is the injured eye, and if he with the injured he of he, with the injured eye, beware you you be, be beware uh, of the one who who the the one who commands. So uh, this is this is now changing the tone, and so clearly this is basically a heck. This is now a spell, a magic spell. Uh, that has something to do with 
War Unas is what he wants to do, which is to climb out of the Duat. So he's saying, uh, basically, you with the injured eye, beware of the one who commands. And then it says, Ujenef, the one who commands, beware, Sa, Satu means you be beware, you be, or beware you uh, of the one with the injured eye. Okay. Uh, and then we say, I, Ayun, Her, Neter. So open, this is very interesting, open. Uh, the face hair it's the, in here in this case it means actually face because we have a logogram sign here so when when you see a sign like that then it's the actual thing that you see is is what's being uh is what's being meant so this is uh the one exception to phonetic spelling in hieroglyphics so usually it's phonetic writing but there are logograms and those logograms um often they, they, what you see is actually what the word is supposed to mean. So it's the entire word, not just a part of the word as a sound. So uh, it says, open the face of the God for Unas. This is, a, this is an interesting indirect uh, allusion to Ra because you cannot look at Ra directly because it's such a bright sun, you would burn your eyes. Uh, I realized this also from something that I was uh, writing about in Under the Sphinx, uh, it's this painting, the vignette of Ra. It's that one very, very unusual feature about this painting is that uh, the sun god is looking at you. It's looking at you when you look at the painting. That's very unusual way to show uh, a god in ancient Egypt, let alone the sun god. And in the coffin text, there are other images, other illustrations where the, the throne is actually empty. And so there is, you don't see the sun god at all. It's just an empty throne because it's something that you can't look at directly. And so Unas now, and, and the coffin texts, uh, just to give you a little bit more background, the idea is for the deceased to journey through the gates uh, towards the sun. And and the sun is in the center of this journey. It's kind of like a spiral, like the, like the game Mehen. And the goal, just like in the game, is to reach the center. The goal in the, of the coffin text is to basically go to the middle, to the center where the sun is on the roads of Mehen. Uh, I'm just mentioning this in passing just to create some associations for you so you understand the context of what is being said here. So this Ayun... Her, Neter, and Unas is, is very, very important. It means so he wants to see the sun god. Uh, this symbol, I'm, I'm having a hard time reading this. It says Unas, this Unas pen, Unas pen means this Unas her, is on the throne. Harry, I, I set means the throne, the great throne. So un, this Unas is on the great throne near. Gez means the side of this god. Okay, so this is the sun god. It's he's sitting on his throne, and Unas is sitting next to the sun god on the throne. So this is is basically in the center of the universe. Uh, the sun is in the center, and this is where Unas has now uh, has reached. So now we come to the last pyramid text of last pyramid text of the south wall. This is PT two seventy two, and it says words to be spoken now. Here's something really interesting. You see how stretched out this text is. This, in here, it's all crammed up. You see the symbols, you know, uh, compressed together. There are symbols for space. The space is used in a very efficient way, but here it isn't. And of course, there's a there's a good reason because the because the word are root is up here in the corner, and that had to be in this corner as the evidence shows. And so you wouldn't be able to write this at the bottom of the previous column. And so that's why all of these symbols had to basically be stretched out. And there is another reason because it gives you sort of a, an impression of something that's tall and extended. And that's exactly what we're reading here. It said Jet, jet Medu means words to be spoken. And then it says Qa'it, which means the height, the elevation. Qa'it, Nai, Deme, demem, demem, demem je, or me, demej, dememje, dem, demem, 
bench, something like that. It's so the, um, I have to give you a little bit of grammar. So the match, as, as you remember, means to join. Uh, and this is the mem match or the mem jet or something like that. And it is, this is called a geminated stem. So when you have a geminated stem, uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, relatively new philological debates that are going on. Egyptologists are trying to decide if a geminated stem is, has to do with grammar or is it has to do with the lexicon? It, does it have a different meaning or is it just an, it's, it's a different, um, a different uh, aspect of the verb that's being used here was this unite. So I think the, the, the consensus is that it is a more intense form of the, the single stem. So demej means unite. And so maybe dememjech, okay, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. It means something like bonding. So it's a, it's a stronger form of joining. Joining means you could just put it together and it's, but it doesn't mean it's necessary bonded together. So with, if you have a double stem, the, the geminated stem, then it could be something like bonded or glued in that sense, okay? Now, I have to tell you that James Allen is translating this as impenetrable. So nai demem jetch means basically, he's, he's saying that it's the height that's not penetrable or impenetrable. So it means it's out of reach basically. And so, uh, uh, so, you know, it's your interpretation is as good as mine, uh, but I just wanted to mention this about geminated stems. So it, if we go with Alan's, it's basically that Unas is lamenting or the text is lamenting the fact that something is still out of reach. It's up there in the sky and you are in the duat in the netherworld and you're trying to reach up there. And what it is that you're trying to reach? Well, it's the Ari root, which is the portal net new, the portal of new. And this has... Remember, this has the rule for lion in it. And of course, my, my theory is that the antechamber is a recreation, a simulated sphinx. So this all makes sense. But there is also an interesting connection to the Great Pyramid, which I'm going to show you in a moment. So to finish this, uh, Ein Unas. So Unas has come. Cheret means near you. Uh, so this is basically the portal that is being addressed the portal of new. So Unas has come to you. Uh, and then it says, I die, which means uh, I die, I ayun. It means uh, ayunti. Ayunti is, is, uh, is a, this is a verb. And the T ending means that it's a stat, the stative. The stative is basically a state. It's something that's not so, not, not existent, does not exist in English, but you can sort of translate it as be open. So be in a state of being open. That's what ayunti means. And so what is being told to the portal is to basically make yourself to be open. That's what this means. I die ayunti. NF means to him, nu, uh, which is a reference back to the cosmic sea, nu here. And it could also be new, uh, could it be the portal? No, it's not the portal. No, it's a reference back to new. And then uh, and then it says, Unas Pai, Unas is the one, Sherer. And now this is what I was saying that we are, the theme is sort of that Unas is now a newborn or a baby or a child. And that's what Sherer means. So Unas is the child, I'm, and I'm means in it. And what he's referring to is this, uh, is this portal or he's at the portal as the child and he's um he's appealing to the to the sort of the motherly uh aspect of this so sherer i'm are you unas pen this unas is depi shem su ra so he is at the head of the followers or the elders i should say shem su of ra um, the followers rather yeah so he's he, this Unas is at the head of the followers of Ra so he's basically saying portal open up I am I am the head the lead of all the followers of Ra so I should be allowed to to ascend into your into your portal 
And, and then he says, and this is an interesting uh, ending here. It says, Nai, uh, so this Unas does not, is not at the head, Depi, of the gods of Tehter. And Tehter means disturbance or drunkenness or chaos or something like that. And there is almost certainly a Techa, I mean, Techa, a Heka, a Heka insinuation hiding in here because Tech, the drunken, the Techi is uh, another word for Thoth, okay? So this could be a magical formula, basically, to open the portal. Uh, of course, you see how the text was changed. There's, it looks like it's an error. I've looked at this for quite a while to decide if it's an error, if it's something that looks like an error, but it's actually meant to be. It's on purpose. Is there something hiding in here? I haven't found anything other than you see a cartouche with the head. So that's kind of an unusual thing to see that you have because that's obviously not Una. So is there, is this maybe the author hiding his own name inside of a cartouche? Uh, is that possible? Um, but I think this Tich uh, Tich is kind of a funny, it's almost humorous the way this reads. So Unas is basically saying, I'm at the head of the, the followers of Ra. I'm not at the head of the gods of disturbance. So he's not, trying, he's not trying to disturb the portal. He wants to be allowed in. And that means he has to know his magic. And that magic is, he's saying, he's, he's insinuating potentially, he's, hey, I have Thoth's magic on me. So you better let me in. Um, anyway, so this is a little bit of detailed text analysis. I wanted to show this to you because it's, uh, it's fascinating. And this is, look, this is just four columns. But how much, how much can you get out of it, right? It's, uh, there's a lot. So um, now let's, uh, let me uh, um, show you something that has to do with architecture. So I'm going to go back to the overall architecture of the Pyramid of Unas to highlight a few things that I didn't mention yet. So, and that has to do with the text column numbers. Um, so here, for example, we have 55 text columns in three registers. So it's 165 text columns. Here's 56. So the numbers that I'd like you to keep in mind is 55, 56 over here, that's important. So 55, but times three is 165. Here's 56. Here we have 43 and 43, and this is south and north. So there's 43 text columns here, 43 text columns here. Then, uh, so, and then remember this portal that I mentioned up here in the, in the southeast corner. Then the next thing I wanted to show you is, the general architecture of the great of the of the Unas pyramid. So the Unas pyramid, Unas was the last king in the fifth dynasty that began with Userkaf. Then we have Sahura, Neferi Kare, Neferi, Sheps Kare, Nayusere, uh, Menkara, and then Jetkari Sesi. Jetkari Sesi, probably Unas's father. Uh, and then if you look at the pyramids of those kings. So here's the nine, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's one pyramid that wasn't finished. So here's eight pyramids of the nine kings. And the main thing that I um, want you to get out of it is that the, the, the architecture of the Unas pyramid, which has the serdab, the antechamber, the sarcophagus chamber, and this sort of straight corridor, that architecture was present in all of its features in the father's pyramid, which was larger, Jetkari Sesi, uh, he basically had exactly the same layout, the same chamber system. The Serdap was basically first used in this king. And then Unas also used the Serdap. But Unas is the only king, the first king that we know that had the pyramid text inscribed in this pyramid. So he is the last king of the fifth dynasty, but he's the first king to ever had pyramid texts written onto his walls. Okay. And as you can see, his pyramid is the smallest from all of them. But there is something interesting about the, the dimensions of their pyramids. So for example, all of these pyramids have between 140 and 150 cubits on the side, 159 here, 150, 150. But Unas's pyramid is 110. And the height of the Unas pyramid, 82 cubits, 
It's also different from all these other pyramids. So 199, 90, 99, et cetera, et cetera. So there's clearly something unique about Unas's pyramid. The first thing is it's the smallest. The second thing is these, these unusual measurements, 110, 82. And then of course, the fact that it's the first pyramid that had pyramid text inscribed. So, but the reason why I'm pointing this out is because these unique features relate right back to the Great Pyramid. And that's one that I'm going to show you next. So here is, this is uh, me sitting in front of the Unas Pyramid. And I've, and then I've, this is a picture I took at Giza. You see the Great Pyramid here. The Great Pyramid was once thought to have been 280 cubits tall and 440 cubits on the side, on the base. And look, Unas's pyramid, 110 on the base, it's a fourth of the Great Pyramid's base, and it would have fit exactly under the king chamber of the Great Pyramid. So I've basically simulated the king chamber here with the two shafts that come out uh, roughly at the height where that king chamber's floor is at 82 cubits. And those 82 cubits, uh, which is the height of the ground, the floor of the king chamber, is the same 82 cubits that is the height of the Pyramid of Unas. So this is already suggested to me that there is a special architectural relationship between the Unas Pyramid and the Great Pyramid. And there is more. So for example, uh, and in order to show you this, I have to take you to, um, uh, I have to take you to two Italian surveyors, um, uh, Maragiolio and uh, Rinaldi. So they published this great survey of the Great Pyramid. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So the, let me show you the big picture. So this is the interior architecture of the Great Pyramid. That's the descending, the entry passage, descending passage, horizontal passage, subterranean chamber. This is the ascending passage, uh, uh, the Grand Gallery, horizontal passage, Queen Chamber, Here's the, the antechamber with the portcullis system. And here's the king chamber with the five relieving chambers, so to speak, and then the roof. This is the known architecture. Out of the chambers, we have the shafts coming out. The, some people think air shafts, some people think star shafts, some people think soul shafts. Um, this video is not really about deciding this, but Robert Bouval, of course, famous with uh, together with uh, Alexander Badawi before him and Virginia Trimble to have proposed that these shafts are aiming for certain stars of certain constellations. So Big Dipper and Small Dipper, uh, Draco, which is the, the North Pole. Um, and then on the, on the South side, Orion and Sirius. So the Queen Chamber pointing to Sirius and, uh, and uh, Kochab in uh, the Small Dipper. And then the king chamber pointing to Orion Belt and um, and the North Pole in, in Draco. So this is Bouval's, Robert Bouval's theory. And so this is a quick review of the architecture of the Great Pyramid. But so what I wanted to show you now is some interesting features that relate back to Unas's pyramid. So for example, um, let me start with the 43 text columns. So the relieving chambers are formed by five tiers of granite rafters, okay? And so let me get you to that right away. So this is basically the view from the east and you see how these granite rafters are laid over uh, these wall blocks here to form these five apartments, so to speak. And the interesting thing is the number of these granite rafters is 98998, and that's 43, okay? And the proof of it is here. So this is now the north-south view. So these rafters are spanning across the meridian, so across from north to south or south to north, right? So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So over the king chamber, the king chamber is covered with nine granite rafters. And then we have a total of 43 granite rafters. And these are the heaviest blocks in the entire Great Pyramid. And look, 
when you look uh, at uh, you look at Unas's pyramid, the there's 43 text columns on the south and the north side. Now, is this could this be a coincidence? Of course, it could be a coincidence, but it's not the only feature, and this is why I'm just bringing it up because it's an interesting numerical bridge to the roof. And does it? And it's also appropriate in terms of the the north south direction. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. But that's not the only thing. So there's other features which are interesting. Which is, for example, here I mentioned there are 56 text columns here on the south side. And now if you go to the grand to the grand gallery, and you count the number of slots on the the east and west side. There are 28 on each side, so that's 56. And that's sort of a columnar arrangement, right? So that is a num that's a number match between the sarcophagus chamber and the grand gallery. But uh, it gets even better than that. So for example, we have 55, we have 55 columns in three in each of three registers. So that's 165 columns. And it turns out that uh, the distance from this spot right here, which is where the shaft comes out of the king chamber, goes through the wall, the distance where that exits all the way out to the pyramid is 165 cubits. So it's three times 55. And, uh, and of course, 55 itself is an important number in the pyramid architecture. We don't have to get into all the details, but I'm just bringing up that 55 and 110 are used with great frequency inside of the Great Pyramids architecture. Um, 55 being a Fibonacci number, and with John Paul and John Paul Bouval and I have published some research where we show that the Fibonacci numbers were uh, instrumental in designing the interior architecture of the Great Pyramid. So. Um, now, I wanted to show you a little bit about the shafts uh, since I brought them up. But uh, for example, you see how in, uh, in the Great Pyramid, there is this grotto, which is subterranean. And then you have this shaft, this vertical shaft that's um, connected to this grotto. And that is a similar idea as in the mastabas that are in the cemeteries around the Great Pyramid, where you also have a sarcophagus chamber and then you have a vertical shaft that's connected. And the interesting thing is these vertical shafts were closed off by a portcullis stone that had little holes. And through those holes was ga gazing the, the, uh, a head, a, a manufactured head that resembled presumably the face of the person that was buried in here. Okay, and in the museum, in the Cairo Museum, you can actually see these heads. Um, so I pulled up this example here, uh, and there's other ones. So these were all found in the Western Cemetery, and these were all the kind of heads that would have been sitting behind this portcullis stone, peeking through this hole. And so you might ask, well, what is the reason for this? Well, it turns out that if you remember that the Ba in Una's pyramid escapes through the north end, and that is the theme of these Mastaba tombs in the same way. So this is a recreation by Hermann Juncker from his uh, surveys of the Western field. And so here you have the sarcophagus chamber, you have its the exit, the entry is walled off. You have this, this fake head sitting here, staring out the portcullis, and then you have a vertical shaft that goes to the sky and that is similar to uh, the idea of having a northern wall here let me take you back to that place so so here's the northern wall of the antechamber and there's the portcullises right so this is similar similar idea uh, it's just in a different style and not and it's a, it's the same theme but it's architecturally made in a different way because the the shaft isn't vertical it's a horizontal shaft but nevertheless it has it's blocked off with portcullis stones um, and in fact when you 
look, when you read here, the text, it actually speaks of the opening of a door. Um, so this is, this is um, damaged here, this column where this is mentioned, but there's another copy of these pyramid texts from the Middle Kingdom where you see the writing that's under this, under this damage here. And it's talking about opening basically the door to a glide path for horse. And that glide path is basically this, this path right here. So this goes out to the North and that's just like, it's just the same idea in other words, as getting out to the Port Carlos and escaping to the North. This, ha this happens to be the Northern shaft of this, this uh, Mastava. So it's the same idea. And there is some other textual proof of it in which I don't have time to get into, but there is some textual proof where these, this, this idea of escaping through a channel, a door to the north is actually mentioning, mentioned in the text and it is on that same north wall. Uh, and there is a way that you can explain both of the shafts that go to the north, the one from the queen chamber and the one from the king chamber. Both of these shafts that go out to the north are basically insinuated in the pyramid of Unas. And this is going to be a, a, film, a presentation in and of itself because it's a little bit involved. But to give you the upshot right now, it's basically right here in two places on this northern wall. Um, so this is something that I'm going to talk about uh, another time. Anyway, so this is. Uh, this completes what I was wanted to talk about. This connection, interesting connection between um, between uh, the pyramid of Unas and the Great Pyramid. And but I just wanted to point out that there is also another pyramid uh, where we have a hint of this shaft on the north side, and this is an, a pyramid that we don't have in its full uh, in its full height anymore only the ruins of it but you can still see the hint of the shaft here and this is i believe this is the the uh the pyramid of uh, sechemchet so this is in zakara and you can see how there's the shaft that's coming off and it is on the northern side and that's equivalent to the idea of having these vertical shafts that are going out to the north of these of the grotto inside the Great Pyramid, of the sarcophagus chamber inside the Mastabas, and even uh, to the north of the Queen Chamber. So it's interesting. It's the same. To me, this looks like, could this be the same idea, but it's architecturally realized in different versions, but it's all the same theme. And I think it is. And the Pyramid of Unas really tells us probably what this is meant to be. It's basically a soul shaft for the Ba flies out to the north and then it comes back when uh, when it returns it comes back to the same shaft and it's always connected to uh, to the sarcophagus chamber the duat chamber basically okay well that was it uh, for this presentation and um, I'll see you next time